Father, I've been changed from a hole into treasure. I've been given a hope and a future. I've been blessed beyond all him together corporately as we are counting our blessings and considering all that he's done for us. Would you join me and just lift your heart up to the Lord. Lord, we, we do come to you this morning as your church here at Calvary Baptist, thanking you and praising you for all of our blessings. And sometimes we have so many difficulties in life and trials and tribulations that they over overcome us, and, and they, they cover our eyes from seeing all the blessings. And Lord, thank you for this song reminding us today uh, that uh, we've got more to bless you for, and more to praise you for than, than the trouble that we have in our life. And so God, help each one to be in our hearts, to be lifted up toward you, thanking you, praising you for the blessings. But most importantly, we thank you for our salvation. Lord, we pray, praise you and thank you for Jesus coming down from heaven, hanging on a cross for six long hours and taking the punishment that we deserve for our sins. And, and now, Lord, all those who believe and trust in him uh, have eternal life and are guaranteed the greatest blessing is salvation, Lord. And so may we even with that um, just praise you and thank you for um, the salvation you've given to us and you offer it to all of us. Lord, I pray for each one today that is going through hardship and, and difficulties, and you might just minister to them today as we um, come together, worshiping you, praising you, 
coming together for the Lord's Supper, reminding us of what you did for us on Cal at Calvary and the fellowship we have downstairs. May it be a, just a wonderful day, lifting up our soul uh, to you and, and encouraging us, filling us with hope and, and great um, uh, endurance, Lord, for, for the trials and, the, and the, the journey that we're on, Lord. So I do pray for each person to experience that today and that we would have a wonderful time of worship. We love you, Lord, and we praise you. May you have your way in all of our hearts and all God's people say, amen. amen. Why don't you turn around and greet somebody and welcome each other to Calvary Baptist. Good morning. Let's gather back together. I kind of wanted to read a Bible verse really quickly. Yeah, I'll read it slowly. Um, kind of thinking about like this song and um, what this song means to me. It's called Behold the Lamb. It's just all about, it's the story of redemption. Um, but I think even greater than that, it's this, the story of how, like, how, how we should be able to view, how we should view God. And so I was like praying about it and found this verse that I read yesterday. It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. And with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the doors were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips. I am a woman of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. I'm going to stop there because there is the rest of it is not applicable to the song. Um, but as we're singing this song really think about think about th those angels singing holy 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 is the lord god Story of redemption. 
redemption written on his hands. Jesus, you will reign forevermore. The victory is yours. We sing your praise. Endless hallelujahs to your hope. dismissed to junior church. Follow that little one quickly, a parent, please. She's all right. Well, praise the Lord. Good singing, guys. We worship the Lord. Amen. Woo. I could have sang that a couple more times. That was beautiful. Well, how's everybody doing? You ready to hear the word? Well, can you open your Bibles for me to Revelation chapter 2, looking at verses 8 through 11 this morning as we work our way through these letters that Christ has given to the churches. I want to read this 
passage, verses 8 through 11. I'll wait for you to find it. End of your Bible, right? Second church that we're looking at together. All right. Let's hear the word of the Lord and pray together. And to the angel of the church of Smyrna write, These things says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blaspheme of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, to, he who has an ear let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Father, I come to you and just pray for um, your spirit to calm me down and help my voice and um, may what is in this passage become alive to every person here today, not just words on a piece of paper, but your living word. May it have free course. May it be glorified in our lives. Give every, everyone ears to hear eyes to see and a heart to understand. We just pray for your blessing upon this time, O oh God. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Apologize for my voice. We are studying these seven letters that are written to the seven churches of Asia Minor. Of the seven letters that we're looking at, this one to the church of Smyrna is the shortest only four verses. Don't get your hopes up, though. A lot is there, uh, even in four verses. I've, I've come to find out I can just take one verse, right? Or just one word, love, and just preach for an hour on it because it's God's Word and it's living. But this is the uh, smallest of the letters. And along with the letter to the Church of Philadelphia, it is the only letter that Christ has given to the churches that comes with no criticism, no rebuke from the Lord whatsoever, only He commends them, He promises a reward, nothing to rebuke them for the, the one who has the eyes of like a flame, of a fire, is examining each church, Right? And he looks at each one up and down and he's checking out their works and what they're doing. And he looks at this church in Smyrna and, and we'll get to the church in Philadelphia. And he says, I find no fault. Blameless. Wow. Powerful. And so what is Christ looking for? What is it that glorifies the Lord when he looks at the you and I and the church collectively, individually, both individually and collectively, what is it that makes the, the, the Lord Jesus smile as He looks upon us as believers and, and as we're gathered together as a church? Because obviously it's not written to individuals, it's written to the church collectively. What is it that makes Him smile and say words like, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Is it not that Jesus is looking at our lives and He's wanting us to be faithful servants? We are just serving the Lord Jesus Christ and we are to be faithful servants and this makes Jesus smile. Now obviously nobody's perfect. Even if you know the Lord Jesus and you've been saved for a long time, the longer you're saved and the closer you get to the Lord, the more you see you've got issues and problems that He is trying to work in your life. But you've got the right direction. You're not living the way you used to live. And so, but there there's still ought to be a pattern, a direction of faithfulness 
that you know that you can make Jesus smile. He looks at you and he says, you're being a good steward of the resources that I've given to you. I've given you time, right? And you're being faithful with that time I've given you. I've given you talents and abilities and spiritual gifts, and you are using them for the glory of God. I've given you treasures, amen? We have a lot to be thankful for. We've got a lot of treasures, financial things, and homes perhaps, right? All of it God gives to us, and He wants us to be faithful. In fact, I would say that God entrusted those things to you and I, has He not? And with those things, he wants us to be faithful servants. And that is what he smiles upon us. And when we mess up, we have the promise in 1 John 1, 9, right? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that is something, the closer you get to the Lord, the more you do that. Because the more you see in your life, I'm not being the way I ought to be. But thank God we see those things in our life. Before we became a Christian, we didn't see those things. Before you became a believer in the Lord, you didn't see the sin of your life. You were kind of blind to it. You just kind of lived, indulging in the sinful things and making excuses for it when you were told about it and things of that nature. Now, it's just like, praise God. You know? Amen. Amen? Or oh me. Amen. Good. We can move on. So, In most of our Bibles, this church is called the persecuted church. That's the description it is given, the persecuted church. But in every sense, if you think about it, every New Testament church is a persecuted church, some more than others. Jesus warned his followers of the days that were going to come upon the church that would bring much persecution. I can spend hours pointing out all the various scriptures that you and I can look at that will describe what's supposed to be going on in the church. Now, in other parts of the world, they are experiencing it in greater, greater depth than anyone in America is. We are blessed beyond measure. But there are believers who, are, who cannot meet openly like this, and they have to meet in secret, and they live their lives always Worried about, not worried, I can use that word, but they're always concerned about the persecution that will come upon them. You and I don't have that, but, but, but someday that is coming to us because Jesus says, listen to Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 to 12, if it doesn't come to our life one day, then how can we apply these scriptures to our life? The Sermon of the Mount, God says, Jesus says, you're, you're a blessed individual, If you're being persecuted, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. So you try to live a right life, you're going to be persecuted for it. Blessed are you, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice, be exceedingly glad. Why? For great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets or the believers who were before you. So blessed are you, he says. It's a blessing that many of us don't experience because we're not being persecuted, but yet the Scriptures say those who desire to live a godly life will suffer persecution. And so our persecution might not be the same that was going on in the church of Smyrna or in other parts of the world, Persecution comes when you desire to live a godly life and you're using your mouth to communicate the gospel to people who, who don't know the Lord and you're, you're, you're creating atmospheres that, that are uncomfortable for those who don't know the Lord to live in. And all of a sudden, they're now going to push back. That will happen. Peter the Apostle Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 4 that we, don't, we shouldn't think it's strange or weird that we're being persecuted. Beloved, don't think it's strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice, again, to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when His glory is revealed, you, you may also be glad with exceedingly joy. It's, it's, it's happening. It's coming true. You told me it was going to happen, and it's really happening, and I know you're in control. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you for the spirit of glory and of God rest upon you. 
On their part, he's blasphemed, but on your part, he's glorified. Glorified. Why, you might ask, are things like this? Why is there persecution that comes upon believers? Why is there so much difficulty for living for the Lord? Why is there so much persecution and suffering at the hands of those who reject the Lord Jesus? Why? Well, it's because Christ said he will build his church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Uh, Christ is building his church universally all over the world. And, and as he's building his church, those who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ are taken out of darkness and placed into light. And the church is advancing against the darkness, right? And as it's doing that, Satan is fighting against it, but he makes the promise that he's going to build the church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. He's going to knock down the gates, knock down the gates, knock them down. He's going to overtake everything because Christ is greater than this world. And so that's why there's so much animosity and hostility against those who are believers and persecution comes. We live in a fallen world and the enemy of God will always be attacking the church because of Jesus. Amen? But Christ promises us that in this world, you and I will have tribulation. In this world, you and I will have trouble. But he says also, be of good cheer. Be encouraged. Why? Because I've overcome this world. Jesus says, I've overcome this world through his death, burial, and resurrection. And you and I can overcome as well. Nothing, nothing can stop the church from advancing where God wants it to advance because Christ is building it. And not only that, Christ is using the persecution. He's using the suffering that is going on in your life and my life to test us, to refine our faith and to strengthen our faith. And so in a sense, every difficulty, every struggle, every trial and every persecution and every suffering that every Christian goes through is not meaningless. Amen? It is not meaningless because God is using every struggle, every trial, every trouble, every suffering, every persecution, and it's not in a meaningless way. It's for you. It's to purify your faith. It has a purpose. It is not meaningless. So when trouble comes, those who are true believers... They will, they will put up with the threats and the discomfort that is associated with Christ. And so we can say that it's not meaningless. There's a meaning for it. It has a purpose. But when trouble comes to those who don't know the Lord, perhaps say they know the Lord, but they're not truly saved. When trouble comes, they will flee in the face of persecution. And only those who love the Lord Jesus Christ will truly remain. And a purging will take place. And that's true of every church throughout all time and even now. That's what persecution does. And so the church, upon its conception, upon the beginnings of the church, has always been under attack. And everyone who becomes a believer and desires to live a godly life will suffer persecution. Those who want to follow Jesus are going to suffer. And this was even greater for the believers that were in Smyrna. The situation in Smyrna, the Jews who were living under the Roman authorities um, were tolerated by the Roman authorities, but that relationship was shaky at best. Rome demanded that the emperor be worshipped, demanded it. But Jews were exempt from that law because of their religion. And as Christianity grew, because it came out of Judaism, the Roman authorities uh, put up with it for some time. But Jewish authorities got tired of Christianity being associated with Judaism, and they began as a lot, I could tell you about this, but just to keep it short, little by little, Christians were no longer seen by the Roman authorities as part of Judaism, and now both Jews and the Romans were persecuting the Christians. And so Christians had to make a decision. They had to make a decision. Deny Christ and worship the emperor. I won't have any more trouble anymore. Or go back to Judaism. And I won't have any trouble anymore. Well, they chose neither. 
they chose neither, and they suffered at the hands of both, both Jews and the Romans, for persecuting the believers. Smyrna, which is modern-day Izmar in Turkey, was famously known as the birthplace of Homer, the famous poet, and also, if you're familiar with this individual, Polycarp was one of the early church fathers. He was the bishop of, of Smyrna, of the church in Smyrna, whether he was the actual pastor of this church that we're talking about or, or just overseeing all of the church activity that was in Smyrna. He was one of the early church fathers. Paige Patterson, in his commentary, he's the uh, president of Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. That's a tongue twister says this to give some a little background here. The history of the city of Smyrna, together with its Christian persecutions and the ultimate martyrdom of Polycarp, provides some reason for assuming that Smyrna was actually a name for myrrh, a fragrance, a fragrant plant that was, that's used in the anointing oil prescribed in the book of Exodus, as well as one of the gifts that the three wise men presented to Mary and Joseph and Jesus, myrrh. And it's used in the process of embalming those who die in both Egypt and elsewhere. But listen to this, it's, it's associated with death. And that's not its only use, he says, but it's associated with death and suffering, and it's well documented. Smyrna then was famous, he says, for two things. If you visit Smyrna, you will see that there's a hill that goes up that looks like a, a crown. It's a beautiful, beautiful city. It's famous for its beauty, but it's also famous and known for its suffering. Many of the Christians suffered much greater than most of the churches. And that's why Jesus has nothing, no criticism for them. He just wants to encourage them because they were suffering. So how does Jesus reveal himself to this church? Look at verse 8. These things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. Jesus is revealing himself as the one who was first and the one who was last who was dead and came to life. Think about how he's revealing himself to this church. Uh, they are going through persecution. And so he reveals himself to them as somebody who controls time. And not only time, but I control Death, I control life and I control death. I am the first. It goes back to the beginning. I am the last. I have control over eternity, just like God does. Jesus is revealing himself as he is God Almighty in the flesh to these believers. I am the first and I am the last. I am he who was dead, yet shall I live. I am alive. I conquered death. So whether, whether you're concerned about how long, Lord, is this suffering going to be upon me? Jesus says, I got it. Trust me. And Lord, what if they kill me? What if they take my life? Jesus says, don't worry about it. Got it. I have, con I have control over life, and I have control over death. Can you see how those words, I am the first and the last, I am, I am, I was dead and now I'm alive, would, would really comfort you if you were in that kind of persecution that was going upon this church. It's amazing what he says to them. And then he says, I know your works. He says that to every church. I know your works. I know your works. Jesus knows your works and your lack of works. He knows everything about your life. He knows everything about my life. And so he looks at what's going on. I know your works. To the church in Ephesus, he knew their works. Their works was they really cared about being doctrinally pure. They, they lacked love for Jesus, but he saw that they were really concerned about being doctrinally pure. What is the works that he sees here in this church, Smyrna? He said, I know your tribulation and poverty. Tribulation is, is translated affliction, and if you have the NIV, but even that doesn't convey their, the, the true situation. It's extensive tribulations. It's tribulation upon tribulations. You and I could never have seen that to this time in our life. And then he says, I know your poverty. And that word poverty means that it wasn't just that they were poor. They lacked the basic necessities for life. That's what it means. He said, Jesus says, I know that. I know what you're going through. I know this is true about your situation, but listen, 
Look what he says here. But that's not my assessment of you. As I examine your life, I know your tribulation. I know your poverty. But he says, you're rich. You're rich. That's how Jesus sees things. Why would he say something like that? Well, because, because Jesus looks beyond all of the temporary material things to what really matters in life. And he says, you might have nothing in this world, yet you're rich in my eyes. You're extremely blessed. It's just so important for us to get because Jesus is trying to prepare us for something. He's trying to prepare his church for something that's going to come. We all have trials and tribulations now. Nothing compared to what they were going through. But all of them are meant to prepare us for the real stuff that's going to become upon Christianity real soon, someday. And we need to understand that this world is not our friend. And we, we tend to forget that, do we not? And we become too friendly with this world. And by that I mean we live with the same goals and the same desires, the same things that this world tells us to seek after. Most of us, if we're honest, we're pursuing the same things. And then what happens is the Lord becomes an afterthought. And we're pursuing after the same exact things. And then so when... All of the things, the materials, the comforts, and the riches, when they are taken away because of our faith, we're going to have a hard time because we're holding on to those things. We have the same desires and the same dreams. We're going to have a tough time surviving. But if we have the mindset that he wants us to have, that this world is not my friend, and I'm going to use my time my treasures and my talents for investing into the kingdom of God. I want to be rich toward God, right? If we have that mindset to the point of exhaustion, as we learned last week, we love Him. And that's why we're doing everything we're doing, right? When all of it's taken away, we're prepared. You know why? The condition of our hearts have already been prepared. Our hearts are not here, brothers and sisters. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be as well. And so if your heart is already there, seek ye first the kingdom of God, right? If your heart is already, I love you, Lord Jesus, and this world I know is not my home, it's there, right? You don't live for the, the dot, you live for eternity, and if you're living that way, not just for the here and now, but you're living for eternity, for what really matters, your, your heart's prepared. And so when, that, when all those things, material things, are just ripped out of your possession because of your faith, it's coming someday, brothers and sisters. When it happens, you're prepared. Because this home, this, this earth is not your real home. You're looking beyond that to the next. Amen? Or oh me. Amen. We need to get there, all of us. So Jesus says, I know your works. I know what's going on in your life. But I also know something else about it. I know the way you've been treated. You've been treated by those who call themselves Jews, but they're not. If you look at verse 9, he says, I know the blaspheme of those who, who say they are Jews, but they're not, but are the synagogue of Satan. I, I, I know I know these people who say that they're Jews, but they're really not. They're, they, they, I know the blaspheme that you're going through. Strong words. The word blaspheme is better translated as slander. They, they were being mocked and ridiculed. They were, lies were being spread about these early Christians. Just real quickly give you some, some uh, the exact nature of it. We don't, un, we don't know because it doesn't tell us in the text, but we can look at history, which would happen with the first and second century Christians and what was going on uh, of the persecution. Uh, they were called, they were cannibals. Right? That's a, a slander. You're a cannibal. You're, you're eating people because they would say that we are coming together to, to, uh, to eat the flesh of Jesus and to drink the blood of Jesus. That's kind of like a gory, right, from John chapter. But obviously that was misunderstood. And so they were labeled as, as being cannibalists. And then they were also labeled that they were immoral because of the love feast that they were celebrating. They called it love feast. And all it was was just fellowship and, and selling what they had to give to the poor and to take care of people and take care of one another. They, they loved each other. And so they were, they were being accused of being immoral and, and having sexual 
relationships with each other, but it was just that they loved each other. And then, because they didn't accept the Greek gods, they were accused of being an atheist. Can you imagine that? And because they spoke so much about the fire of the Spirit and the fire of divine judgment, uh, they were labeled as arsonists. In addition to that, their unwillingness to pay homage to Caesar as Lord earned them the accusation of being disloyal to Rome. So all this was upon them. The Roman authorities were persecuting them and, and the slander that was being communicated. But why does Jesus say that they, they say they're, they are Jews, but they're not? They're of the synagogue of Satan. Those are pretty strong words, are they not? Why would he say something like that? Well, remember the, Jesus' words to the Pharisees in John chapter 8. In John chapter 8, they, the, the Jewish people were saying that they were Abraham's descendants and they were following Abraham's teachings. And Jesus says, no, you're not. If you were following Abraham's teaching, he says, I know, you're, you, you, I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. Can you imagine being told that God's word has no place in you? You, you don't have any room for God's word in your life because you're not following what you're supposed to be following. And that's what he was saying to, the, to these Jewish people who were trying to kill him. This is what happened to Jesus. The same thing's happening to the early Christians here in Smyrna. People want to kill you. They want to get rid of you. Down in verse 42 of, chapter, of John 8, Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God, nor have I come from myself, but he sent me. Why, why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. And here he is. Here's the declaration he makes of these religious people and how it connects to our, our text. You are of your father, the devil. And the desires of your father you want to do. Uh, he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. But because I tell you the truth, you don't believe me. What is he saying there? He's saying that there are two kinds of people in the world. And your behavior and your love for the word and your place of God's word in your life shows who you belong to. There are children of the devil and they're children of God. Just saying you're a child of God doesn't mean you are. What place does God's word have in your life, right? Are you listening to his truth? Are you following Christ? If you've been born again, then you are a child of God, right? But if you're not, then you are a child of the devil, even though you don't know that, right? And you're doing his works. You, God's word has no place in your life. You don't like the truth. You don't want to know the truth. And the Bible would tell you, you need to be born again. Your first natural birth results from God's wrath being upon you, and you will, when you die, you will suffer for all eternity in the lake of fire. That's what he's talking about here in our text, that they are not true Jews, because if they were, they would listen to the words of God. I've come from God, and they're not listening. And the way they're treating this church reveals that they're not true Jews. They are of their father, the devil. And that's true of every person in the world. Where's, where's God's word has place, where, what place does God's word have in your life? That's why we need to be born again. In verse 10, Jesus tells the church to trust him. He says, there is really some bad, bad, hard stuff coming your way. Look at verse 10. Uh, Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. There's some bad stuff that's going to come upon you, worse than you've seen so far. Indeed, the devil is about to throw, throw, some, of you, throw some of you in prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Jesus says, don't fear the things that are about to come upon you. How does he know that? Jesus says, I I am the first and I'm the last. I got control of time, right? I was dead and now I'm alive. I have control of life and death. I know what's about to come to your life. And things are going to start getting worse. Some of you, not all of you, are going to be thrown into prison. And you're going to be tested for how long? Ten days. 
So he's controlling it. And so listen, brothers and sisters. I'm not even going to look at my notes because I'm running out of time here. Listen. Every trial and tribulation and difficulty that comes, that's coming in their life, that's going to come in your life and my life as well. And listen to me. I truly believe this. Even evil things that come from Satan, they're controlled by Jesus. They're controlled by God, and they're only, He only permits it for a short time. It's true. He only permits it for a short time. He's in control of all the difficulties that comes in your life. And it's, He says to us that it's a test. It's a test. Is your faith real? Are you truly born again? Do you truly know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? It's a test. It's going to strengthen your faith. It's going, to, it's going to weed out those who are true believers and who those who are not. And so when persecution comes upon the true believer, they might be embarrassed. They might deny the Lord. We know Peter did, right? Three times he denied the Lord. But Jesus came to him and restored him. He didn't ultimately deny the Lord and walk away and say, this is not worth it, right? And so when persecution comes, trouble comes, if you're a true believer, you might be weak in the flesh, you might fall, but you're going to get back up. You're going to get back up because you love the Lord and you believe that he died for your sins, he was buried, and he rose again in the third. You truly believe. What God's word said is true. And so he says, coming. Some of you are going to be thrown into prison. Not all of you, but some of you will. I got, I'm controlling this. It's only going to be for 10 days. So notice he's saying, I'm, notice he's saying, he's not saying, I'm going to not let any bad things happen to you. <laughs> I'm going to remove the difficulties from your life because I love you. No, no, no. He's not saying that. He's saying, it's coming. But then he says, be faithful. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Be faithful unto death. Those are are some hard words. Those are some strong words. Hard to preach, hard to listen to, but they're true words from the Lord. Be faithful unto death. That's what He wants us to be, faithful, even unto death. And so if we truly love the Lord, if we're a true believer, we will be faithful unto death. Jesus taught a parable in Matthew 13. Seeds were being sown. Some of the seed, he says, was sown among the thorns. And when difficulties of life came, it, 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 it put pressure on that which grew, right? And the cares of this world and the desires for other things crushed it. What it is indicating is that there was really no life there from the get-go. And that's what happens to those who don't truly know the Lord. When those pressures come, they say, this is not worth it. I'm going to walk away. But our faith is genuine when it is tested. It will remain faithful all the way to the end. And then Jesus says this, He who has ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. All right, let's listen to this for a minute. Whew. I have to take my jacket off. I'm getting hot, man. Listen to this. There's a lot of pain in this life, is it not? There's struggles in this life, and they hurt. They're painful. Even death, depending on how you die, is painful, right? And so Jesus is saying that you might have pain in this life and struggles, and it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt as you know what. I won't say the word, but it's going to be painful. But if you're a true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you might experience that. But the second death that's going to come, you won't feel that one, baby. You won't feel that one. See, there's a first death that comes to everybody, right? We all die. Ten out of ten people die, right? And it's, it could be physically painful to die. But that's going to come upon everybody. The second death will only come upon those who don't know Jesus Christ. Let me read it for you. 
Revelation 20, verses 12 to 15. I saw the dead, small and great, is the vision that John is having, standing before God, and books were open. This is judgment day. You ready for it? This is going to happen. All the dead are going to stand before God, small and great. Books are going to be opened. Another book was opened, which is called the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the book. So we think this is called the book of records. That every work you've done is going to be judged by the Lord, right? The sea, he says, gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades, death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And so the picture is this. That there's a temporary place, death and Hades, where all those who are being held are going to be dumped into, watch, and they were judged each one according to the works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is forever. It's hell. Hades is a temporary place that all those who, are, who have died are, are being held there, those who are without Christ, obviously. And they're going to be dumped into the lake of fire. And look what he says about this. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. This is God's word. And so a second death is awaiting after your first death. A second death is waiting for those whose names are not written in the book of life. In other words, you're not saved. You're not born again. You might be religious. You might know about Jesus. You might know God. But you've never been born again. You're going to experience two deaths. Physical one, it's going to be painful, but the second one is going to be much more painful for it's for all eternity in the lake of fire. That is waiting for all those who have rejected Christ. And when they die, that's the death that they're going to face. It's the death you don't want to face. Jesus has promised in every believer, you're going to overcome. Every true believer is an overcomer, and you will not, look, catch this, you will not be hurt by the second death. Hallelujah, amen. That is God's word, God's promise to you as a believer. Don't fear what's about to happen to you. Jesus says, I got this. Hold on to him, trust him, and he'll carry you through it no matter what, how difficult it's going to be. He's going to carry you through it because he loves you. He loves you. He says to you, be faithful unto death. Be faithful unto unto death. Now, as I close my message this morning, I want to end with an analogy, an illustration. Consider Jesus, if you will. Consider Him like a parachute. Consider Him like a parachute. Suppose you are in a plane. You are 25,000 feet in the air. And the stewardess comes to you and tells you to put on a parachute. And she says to you, in a few moments, the plane is going to go down and you will need this parachute to survive. Do you argue with her? Do you debate with her? No. Thank you very much. Put it on. Ain't no one getting this off of me, right? I'm 25,000 feet in the air. I'm going down. I want this parachute. You treat the parachute like your best friend. You feel really good about that parachute. You know, you're kind of still nervous, obviously, because, you know, hey, it's still some unknowns here, but I'm trusting this parachute. I'm trusting it. I'm holding on to it. It means a lot to me. I want you to consider Jesus that way. Because it doesn't matter how uncomfortable you are on that plane. Even if someone pours hot coffee on your lap. Even if people are mocking you and making fun of you, sitting there with your parachute, you look like a fool. They can do all that. Ain't no one getting this parachute off me because I need it to survive. It's, it's my Savior. It's going to save me. Would you consider Jesus the same way? In the same way, Jesus is like a parachute. He's like a parachute that every person needs, that's going to need it for the jump that's going to come. Death will knock on all of our door someday. Ten out of ten people die. And you'll face God as the books are going to be opened. This is going to happen. You need a parachute. His name is Jesus. How do you get him? I'm glad you asked. You need to repent. Many times we just say, ask Jesus into your heart. That's what we tell people. Ask him into your heart. Say this prayer. The Bible says repent. 
Repentance is simply this. You know you how you feel about sin right now. You know where you're living. You know what's right and what's wrong. If God's convicting you about what's, what you're, how you're living in your life and you don't have Christ in your life, you need to repent. You need to turn from that attitude that I don't need what this preacher's saying. I don't need Christ in my life. You need to repent from the attitude that, and, and the way you're living that God's Word has no place in your life. He should be first in your life. And, in, and in, with that attitude of repentance, of sorrow for sin, trust Jesus Christ. Believe upon Him. Put Him on. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and wear Him like a parachute because only He can save you from the jump to come. Amen? And so if Jesus Christ is not your parachute, if He's not your Savior, you will be hurt by the second death when it comes. And that is going to be much more painful than anything this life has to give to you. And so Jesus looks at your works. He looks at my works. He looks at all the things that are going on in our life. And what does he see? You know. I know. I know how he sees me. When we close now in a word of prayer, would you do business with God? Would you talk to the Lord right now where you're sitting, every head bow? Every eye closed. Do you have a relationship with the Lord? Is Jesus your Lord and Savior? Are you prepared to stand before God on that judgment day and the books are opened? Are you prepared for that? Does that bring any concern to you? And if it does, it should. And good, I'm glad it does. But you can leave here today with forgiveness from God for all your sins. Simply turn from them. Turn from the, the, the attitude you have toward them that it's not a big deal. Turn, turn from loving them. Turn from wanting to live in sin and look to Jesus who died for that sin, died for all your sins. And would you trust him today? Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. God's word promises you'll be saved. You'll be forgiven. Oh, Christian, today, what place does God's word have in your life? Christian, do you desire to be faithful even unto death. Know that trials are coming. Tribulation will come. Seek first the kingdom of God. Rid your heart from the love of this world. Do not love this world, nor the things in it. Love the Lord. Love Him more. Be faithful unto Him. With your, with your talents, your treasures, your time, Oh, Lord, I pray that each one of us know where we're at. We've had some talk with you. We've had some things that we've straightened out, and today is a new day for us. The next step we're taking, and I pray, God, for fruit to come from this time in everyone's life. And I pray this in Jesus' precious name. And all God's people say, amen. Hey, today is the first Sunday of the month, all right? So we're doing a little different. We're not going to have a uh, come forward kind of a thing, right? But I'm going to have you stand up, and in your bulletin, hopefully, if not, it'll be on the overhead, probably on the overhead. We're going to have, uh, we're going to read our covenant together because we're going to prepare ourselves for the Lord's Supper. And so whether you are a member of Calvary or not, if... You uh, are here today, which you are, because you're standing up. Um, reading this covenant is just what, what we as members of Calvary have agreed to. And so if you're visiting with us, it's just uh, you'll get a feel of where we stand and 
why we do what we do and how we feel about each other and how we feel about the Lord. And, and perhaps that might be something that might intrigue you and you might say, you know, I should join this church. I like the way, I like, how, I like what they stand for, right? And so that's something that you desire. You make sure you come and talk to me, all right? Together, our covenant. Ready? All together. Since we have committed ourselves to Jesus Christ and have experienced the acceptance, forgiveness, and redemption of God our Father, we covenant together as members of this church that with God's help through the guiding presence of the Holy Spirit, we will walk together in brotherly love, we will show loving care for one another and encourage, counsel, and admonish one another. Breathe. Okay. We will assemble faithfully for worship and fellowship and will pray earnestly for others as well as for ourselves. We will endeavor to bring up those under our care in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Okay. We will seek by Christian example and personal effort to win others to Christ and to encourage their growth toward Christian maturity. We will share one another's joys and endeavor to bear one another's burdens and sorrows. We will oppose all conduct which compromises our Christian faith and will uphold high standards of Christian morality. We will prove the reality of our conversion by living godly and fruitful lives. We will maintain a faithful ministry of worship, witness, education, fellowship, and service. We will be faithful stewards of our resources and abilities and sharing the gospel with peoples of all nations. As a result of this covenant relationship, we will seek earnestly to live to the glory of God who brought us out of darkness into his everlasting life. light. Sorry. We, moreover, engage that when we are removed from this place, we will soon as possible unite with some other church where we can carry out the spirit of this covenant and the principles of God's word. Amen. Let's pray together, and I'll have the men come forward as we partake of the Lord's Supper. Father, thank you for this covenant. Thank you for uh, this church, and thank you for what we stand for and, and our desire to uh, be all that you want us to be. And this covenant uh, represents um, the vision that we have for what this body should look like. And we pray that you would help us to fulfill it and that it would be true of our lives, that it would be something that, that um, people, not just ourselves, but people outside of this church would see us and see our love for each other and our faith in you will not just be word, but it will be in deed as well. And so we pray that you will help us and the culture of this church would become what this covenant declares, and it would be true in our lives. And so uh, bring us to that, Lord God. Help us. In Jesus' name I pray, and all God's people say, amen. You may have a seat, and then I'll have the men come forward who are going to be um, serving you the Lord's Supper. Joe Maroon on my right, and Mark Donatio on my left. All right. Before we partake, I want to read God's Word in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, just to give a little bit of an instructions about what we're about to do. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, you can listen to this. It says, For I received from the Lord... That which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So twice he said... He's saying that these are instructions, right? But I want you to do this, to eat the bread and drink from the cup. And do this in remembrance of me. Now, there's no uh, wording there that, uh, that indicates in any way that it, it, it'll, it'll attribute to our salvation in any way. It doesn't make us a Christian. In fact, he's writing this to believers who are already saved, and they already are forgiven of their sin. And so they're not partaking of it to become forgiven, 
they are uh, doing it in remembrance of what Jesus has already done for them. Does that make sense? And so it's a celebration of their salvation. They are doing this in remembrance of Jesus. And what that simply means is that, that we're looking to you, God, Jesus, and what you did for us on the cross. Uh, the bread represents uh, you dying for our sins and that your body was broken for us, right? And the blood that was in the cup represents the New Testament, the new covenant that we are under, and, and it represents the, the, the blood that was shed for our sins. Our sins have been cleansed through the, through the uh, shedding of your blood, through the washing of our sins because of the blood of Christ. So do this. So when we're partaking of this, we're doing it in remembrance of, of all those things I just said, of what he did for us on the cross. And so when you're holding that piece of bread, just think about all that happened to Jesus. He, he, he suffered and died for you. Uh, uh, he, he was tortured. He was, really went through a lot, did he not? And, and that, that bread just reminds you of what Jesus did for you so that your sins can be forgiven. And thank him for it. Worship him for it. The bread is not Jesus. It doesn't become Jesus. It just reminds us of what Jesus has done. Does that make sense? And the cup in the same way. The cup you're holding in your hand is reminding you of the new covenant that you're under, right? That you're no longer, you're not under the old covenant. You're under the law, right? Uh, Jesus has come and he's fulfilled the law. The new covenant now you're under. You're under that new covenant, and you're, it's the law of Christ, the law of love, the love of Christ that was demonstrated on the cross of Calvary to wash away your sins, all your sins, not just some of them, past, present, and future, all washed away. You stand before God, forgiven of all your sins. Your identity now is in Christ. It's a wonderful, wonderful um, testimony. He says, well, often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. And so we're, we're actually proclaiming. We're, we're telling the world that this is what we stand for. This is what Jesus has done for us. He's, he died for our sins. He, his blood was shed for us. And we're communicating that as we partake of the Lord's Supper. And he says, you're going to do this until he comes. One day Jesus will come back and, and uh, I, we'll do it with him, right? We'll have a celebration up there in heaven. But he does give a little uh, warning here. Verse 27, therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner uh, will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself, and then let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the body of the Lord. And so what he's saying there is before you partake of the Lord's Supper, make sure you're saved. Make sure that you know for sure you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you're not doing this because you think it's going to wash away your sin. You're not doing this because you're going to try to score points with God. You're doing it because you, are, you want to remember what he did for you. You're so discerning the Lord's uh, body. And so if the, if the, when the elements come to you and you're not, a, you're not sure you're saved, it's okay. Let it pass you. Let it pass you and, uh, you know, don't partake. Or... Better yet, before it comes to you, all it takes is a prayer of saying to God, you know what? I'm not ready to meet you. I'm not ready to see you. I'm not ready to go to heaven. I, in fact, I, I'll go to hell when I die. I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. I want my name written in the book of life. And so right now where I'm sitting, I want to turn from my sin. I don't want to love it anymore. I don't want to serve it. I don't want to follow it. I, 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 need, I need you to save me. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. The moment you say those, those words to God, you're saved, you're forgiven. You truly meant it. And then when the cup comes to you and the bread comes to you, partake of it. Partake of it with gladness in your heart, knowing you're forgiven and you're celebrating your salvation. Amen? Amen. But don't partake of it if you're not sure. All right? Let me pray one more time. And then the men will serve you. And as I'm praying, take some time now to prepare your heart and life before you receive these, uh, this, the bread and the, and the cup um, where you're at spiritually. Father, I pray you search our hearts. You know where we're at spiritually. You know if we're with you, if we know you. And so I pray that 
that uh, everyone here would all know where they're at spiritually. And we can uh, rejoice in our forgiveness. So have your way in all of our hearts and life, and that we would uh, enjoy this worship. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And I'll read the verse, and then we'll partake together. Father, thank you. Thank you for dying on the cross for us, for giving us, shedding your blood for us, Lord. Help us, dear Lord, that this would not become mundane, that we would not just simply do that as routine. Help us, Lord, that it would reach the depths of our hearts and understand what it means for God to be in the flesh himself for us. How much is our value to the world that we are really nothing and we are made out of nothing. Thank you, Lord, for doing that. Help us, Father, that we remember what you said until you come. You are alive. You will come. Help us hang on to these promises no matter what difficulties we have. Recognize what you've done for us, that you are in control, and that we are valued. Jesus says, take heed, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake. Jesus, you are so good to us. Thank you, Jesus, for volunteering your own life, surrendering to the will of the Father, willingly, for your love for the people of God. Hanging on a cross, enduring the wrath of God all so that others can benefit and receive forgiveness thank you for that sacrifice we love you we thank you for it in Jesus
Jesus' name. Amen. shed his blood so that we could become spotless, white as snow. We could go be with God's people. Lord, I pray that that we remember this each and every day of our life. That sacrifice for us. He willingly laid himself down. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Lord God, I just want to pray and thank you for the fellowship that we're having, worshiping you and thanking you for what you did for us on the cross of Calvary. We just want to continue lifting our voices to you. So I pray, God, that you would be worshiped in our hearts. You will hear our song. It's a song to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't we all stand and sing together?